member of the NPP. He made it through the SPA delegates, but didn't get beyond the SPA delegates in this particular case. This was the first time. In fact, in Legon, when I was a student, he was still uh, contested in 2007. So you would know by now that he's a veteran in the space. Kwabna Eje Japan, a former general secretary of the MPP too. I mean, when he's not doing politics, he's a fine engineer most of the time. <laughs> Thank you're you welcome very, sir i hope you're doing fine sir. i'm very good raymond very very brilliant good. how was the run like it's very interesting as mm -hmm. you said it's something i've always enjoyed i've been involved in politics since professor dubois hens mm -hmm. so i've traveled around the country uh, with mr kufo with nanado in 1998 now current president and then myself run for general secretary um mm -hmm. running 207 as the youngest of the mm -hmm. 17 aspirants uh, famously then called Mujamuno. Mujamuno, <laughs> yes. I recall that very much. <laughs> you know, mm. so um, it was a return to what I'm used to, and it, it provided me a wonderful opportunity, okay. considering what had transpired in 2015, and I'm sure everybody is aware of that, to interface with the party um, grassroots and um, have a Q&A session with them, so that to have that dialogue, open mm. discussion, and so they could ask me all the questions that they want to ask. And it provided me a good platform to communicate with Ghanaians and what I believe that we need as Ghanaians right now, which is the ushering in of a, a new dawn. And I think it's important that um, all of us, not only we the politicians, you the media, mm -hmm. uh, professionals, farmers, everyone, should recognize that the direction that we have been on the trajectory that the country has been on for the last 30 years hasn't brought us to where we desired to be. So it is time for us to reposition ourselves, to reevaluate ourselves, to rethink our strategies, to restore back to basics our values, especially our dedication to our country, and to think in the collective. So I want to see this election as an opportunity for our flag bearer to launch himself, as he said, a new vision. Uh, uh -huh. to provide that kind of leadership that will end the trust of Ghanaians. And that's, I'm, I'm excited about that. Would it be fair to say you have given up on becoming president? The important thing is not about me as a person becoming okay. president. Okay. My passion is about the change and the transformation of the Ghanaian. And that passion is very profound. It's not about me, the individual. I know that given the opportunity, I'll do a fantastic job. But again, anybody whose views coincide with mine, Okay. Um, I'm prepared to work for. I am for the collective security of the Ghanaian people. I am for the goodwill of the Ghanaian people. So that is what we should be looking at as politicians, as Ghanaians, how we can save society. I mean, your, your day is done when you've been able to contribute something that puts a smile on a fellow Ghanaian's face. So that, for me, is what we should look out for as Ghanaians, as politicians. Our very understanding of politics, governance, mm -hmm. public service should be exactly what it is, service to the public. So my triple S is something I'm very passionate about. Okay. And I do hope that uh, Dr. Baumia, who has become our flag bearer, would uh, piggyback on some of these things. Because service is key. You have the spirit of service. Sacrifice. Be prepared to, to sacrifice for the common good and also to be selfless. This spirit of individualism that has gripped Ghanaian politicians. We should not create what I call monsters out of politicians. And, and here's to that hero personality call thing that is disturbing this country. And that's why some time ago I had reason to say that Siko Fancy has become a little bit of an enterprise in our country. Mm -hmm. We need the checks and balances in society. Now, it, it's interesting you bring up all of these issues mm -hmm. because I want us to draw down to the just end the primaries. That's right. You dropped out in the first one. That's right. When the second round continued, do you think that this was a fair, credible, or if you could choose the words that Afarajad never liked using, a free and fair process to elect flag bearer? Well, I think you should look at what the contestants, the final contestants, said on the day. And the main contestant admitting that he believed this was a fair and transparent process. The fact that immediately after the superdelegates, I came out and said, look, I think I accept the result. I'm a Democrat. I believe in the rule of the majority. Mm -hmm. The majority sometimes don't get it right. But at least we should respect the willful choice of the majority. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it to the top five. 
uh, I thought I would have been in there. But that is politics. Sometimes you don't get what you want. But your capacity to accept reality is very important as a political leader. And I do believe that the elections committee listen to some of the advice. I've been general secretary before. I've superintended this kind of elections in 2014. And yeah. the best thing to do is to leave most of the work in the hands of the Electoral Commission. The Electoral Commission is a professional institution that is constitutionally mandated to run yeah, elections. elections. So they have loads and tons of experience. And the system's available to them. Available to them. So once you do that, and once they listen to that kind of advice in the first meeting with we, the, uh, the aspirants, we say, look, let the albums, everything, the, the running of the poll at the polling station, be handled by the electoral officer. The electoral officer is appointed by the electoral commission, not the political party. Because, you know, sometimes, mm -hmm. especially within this battle when some really openly declared mm -hmm. for one mm -hmm. or the other, you know, it created a little bit of uneasiness when they are superintending the election. And I think it went well, the police administration, I mean, in the super delegates. A, a more direct question would be, yeah. did the best man win or the most resourceful won? That's an interesting one, you know, but I don't want to second guess the decision of the majority. Mm. At the end of the day, uh, he won close to 70% in the superdelegates and did over 61% 60 with the generality close to 200,000. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to give him credit. I mean, that's the first time, a first time, um, getting those figures. I mean, you go back into our political history. Not a Dubuahene, not Kufu, not a Kufu Adu, got that at the first time of asking. So I think we have to give credit to Dr. Baumia. Um, apparently, I would like to say that he's used the platform that was provided him, mm -hmm. the vice presidential platform, to good effect. And, uh, and so, therefore, I think. Not we, abuse of incumbency. Well, with incumbency, yes, there, there, there will be. I complained in the beginning, especially yes. when I saw a lot of the government machinery coming out in the open. As politicians, you tend to support one another, but they are tenants of good governance. And that's why I disapproved of public, and, and, and what, what do I call them, the CEOs especially, coming out openly. Because when you are appointed as a CEO of a state organization, you are a national figure who works for the state of Ghana. So it is important that you respect the covenants the, the governance tenant. So that's what I'm saying. I, I think that we had an issue with that, but we have to do The question is whether or not the best person won or the most resourceful won. I think what is important is the people had the opportunity to freely express their wish. And again, I think from all the reports that we have received, especially from those who participated, at the Accra State, admitting that they felt this was a very transparent mm -hmm. and open process. Right from day one, I had the opportunity to go around and talk to people. There were a few times that um, were a bit apprehensive, especially when state officials like uh, CEOs of public organizations came out openly to support, which I thought ran against the tenets of good governance. Mm -hmm. Those are things that I was not happy with. But Put it all together, once the people have de delivered a mandate and everybody accepts that the process was reasonably free and fair, I think that, that's, that once a result is delivered, um, we have to respect that result and accept that reality. Did the best man win? I think that we have a winner. That I do not want to describe somebody mm -hmm. as better than others. Okay. I want to describe the winner as the wishes of the majority of our people. And we work with that person. If I could press you further on yeah. that, if you had the resources available to the vice president, would you have won this election? Well, resources do matter in, okay. in elections. I mean, I was working a, sh a shoestring budget. Mm -hmm. um, but I said to myself, sometimes... If all the CEOs declare this support of you... I would you, not. If I, all I, the I don't, I don't ministers think, declare no, this support no, I, of I, you... I, I think if it, members it, of parliament abandon their work in parliament to follow you around... Let's be very clear. Send a signal to what, their constituents. No, no, no. What is... What I'm, I want to stick to mm -hmm. are principles. And I've said this before. If you want to support... There are people who supported me by quietly. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think that is fine. 
you know, because our party has rules of engagement, we have ethics, things that lines that we should not cross. Okay. So I, I don't want, or I don't want to accept the fact that, um, especially CEOs of public organizations who should come out openly and support my campaign. That is not acceptable, and I don't want that to happen to anybody. But these are lessons that we can learn from this process so that it can guide us as we are going forward. Suffice it to say that the 200,000 or so nearly delegates who voted mm -hmm. had the opportunity to freely express their will. Okay. And I think all the reports that your correspondents mm -hmm. who followed That's the true, thing went across, across the country didn't report of any shenanigans. Mm. You know, so I think that we should accept that. I'm proud as an MPP person. Is it problematic that some members of your party were insistent on if they had not received monies, they said one candidate gave 400, the other gave 300. If they have not Re received Raymond, those Raymond, monies... I don't want to get into that. No, I get you. I'm I, saying that, is it problematic that some said they will not vote unless they receive that? It means they don't money. understand their role. Nobody pushes you to become a polling station executive. Mm. And the focus of your duty is to run the local campaign. Every polling station has a limited area of reach maybe 100 or 200 houses, maybe 1,000 people. Mm -hmm. That is your work, to focus on reaching out and canvassing for the party. That's what you're supposed to do. You are not just a voting <laughs> element. So the preoccupation with being a delegate because you're coming to vote, that is not the focus of the polling station concept. Okay. It is the unit of political activity. They have a bigger role to play in our political party than just voting. Do so I, I think the monetization of the process is wrong mm -hmm. and I want to encourage them for them to understand that this party was fashioned out of adversity at a time of real struggle mm -hmm. in this country and people lost their lives, people lost their businesses, people had to sacrifice that spirit of voluntarism, that spirit of giving. Not the spirit of receiving. It is not what you get out of the political process that matters. It is what we give to the country Ghana through our political parties. So if this has shifted from the ideals of 1992, then it is incumbent on all of us, okay. political leaders, to lead by example. But I think PRRs, they have seen a few things that has confused them. And, uh, you know, the youth today, you know, um, they have become a bit apathetic. And then their view of service to the country has been distorted. You know, so I think we need to throw out there more inspiration to mm. inspire them the more. And that's why my political career has been anchored on what I call the triple S. Service, sacrifice, selflessness. And Tescon has a beautiful thing about what? Commitment without, without inducement. inducement. That mm -hmm. is what it is. And we've got to go back to basics. This monetization is wrong and we need to tell it straight to the delegates, to tell it to everybody mm. in our politics that we go in there for the welfare of the common good, to go and save the Ghanaian people. That's what we should be looking at. I get your point. Yeah. Now, there's some jostling for who becomes a running mate to Dr. Baumia. Um Is it a creation of you, the media, or is there no, some jostling? There, is, there has always been. Really? In fact, we know some who are all over the place, lobbying virtually everybody they can, there are so many theories about who is doing what, and it's very clear. <laughs> really? But I, let me explore that point to the members of parliament. Do you also think that the running mate should come from the Ashanti region and should be a member of parliament? Let me tell you something. The running mate from history, people should learn from history. Mm -hmm. Okay? All the running mates that we've had, from Edubo Aire to Kufo mm -hmm. to Nanado, they've never been the obvious choice. That is a fact. I see. I'm telling you the truth. That is mm. what has happened. Mm. So I don't know why people even want to be the obvious choice. The more obvious you are, the less likely you are going to you be. You are going to be interesting. I mean, so um, I want to look at the history. Not a parliamentarian? Look, it is the prerogative and the sole prerogative of the presidential candidate to select his partner. What then happened to Haji Ali Mamahama? What, what, what are you saying? We were told that she was the preferred choice of Donaldo in the first place. You were told by who? Yes, I mean, deep uh, through these, sources. These are all... You don't believe that? I don't I mean, believe you that. Were, we no, were I was part yes. of the National Council. Yeah. I was there that day in that meeting. Was she not presented? No. Really? Candidate she never came up? 
never, she, he presented Dr. Baumia. I was surprised because I knew Dr. Baumia because I was press secretary to mm -hmm. Kufour and he worked closely with Dr. Aqua, the, mm -hmm. the, the governor of the Bank of Ghana. So we had several meetings with the IMF in the castle. We both sat in the meetings. That's how I got to know him. You know, so, um, and I knew he was a, a technocrat and wasn't involved in politics. So first when I heard the name, I thought it was a joke, mm -hmm. you know, but then he threw it out there and he got his way. I mean, of course, there will be a few of us who raised issues why he didn't look inside the party, why he was going to look outside. But we respected his position as president. President Kufo also insisted and said he's going to be the president. He's going to work with the person. And so that is it. So. We should leave so Dr. Baumia the latitude, the latitude to decide who he wants to work with for the best uh, results that we can master. If you are approached, would you accept or reject it? I don't want to create news here on this It's matter. an important point. I am a party the, faithful. Yes. I've worked for the party in various capacities. Yeah. You understand? I'm just and waiting I, for you to get to that I, point. I always serve the party, but I think that Let's not create a new scenario, another battle in the media as to who becomes a running mate. We've, we've had, I know the media has, Again. Fed, has fed very fast Again. on this uh, presidential if contest. And eventually, eventually, yes. eventually, eventually we've had someone... I know you are not a Tim Russell. I, I'm not a Tim Russell at all. I know but I, I, that, I think that this is question important. is important. If you are approached, would you accept or reject it? I think any party person who is okay. patriotic who has the disposition to serve your country, should, should, it's a wonderful opportunity if you mm. get it. Mm. To be number two, that's, 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 that should be a source of pride. Okay, you that's understand? So I think that, that for me is a no-brainer. But, but most importantly, I think we should stop creating... I want us uh, to discuss criteria, for example. Should no, a person come live, from the live, southern part of this country? No, I don't want to discuss because that. Because your party... I am a detribalized, I'm a detribalized guy. I agree perfectly, okay. but I was trend. born in Kumasi. Mm -hmm. Did my primary school in Kumasi, secondary school in Infansibum in Kipkos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but spent a lot of my time in Accra mm -hmm. as a civil engineer. Yeah. And so I, I don't care where you come from in this country. That, for me, but, for but me, you know there's a trend. The NPP, the, except for in 1996, mm -hmm. where coin cancer actually yeah, that, came that on was board. that was an, the Great Alliance. Alliance there. That was the Great Alliance. The NPP has always chosen a Northerner versus a Southerner. Uh, it's always been the case. Raymond, right. I want us to de-emphasize ethnocentric things in our country. But we're looking for criteria for determining who becomes... No, no, it is not for you to do that. It's for Dr. Baumia to do No, that. we are also invested in the politics of this country. It is. But so, I, you so should trust and the conversation him. is happening. I don't. I think you guys are driving it. Really, <laughs> you guys are driving <laughs> it. <laughs> I think it's it's good news for your mm. sensationalism and it attracts viewers and listenership. So you've, I've seen you've lined up people who yes. are the likely. Why do you want to do that? Why do you want to heap but, pressure but, on the vice president, no. uh, the the flag bearer? But perhaps he has to go through that fire. But the most important. He's been through enough. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. No, there's another question related to this. Before I leave the vice presidential zone, okay. There's another question related to it. That's right. He came up second in the just and the primaries, Kennedy of Japan. Mm -hmm. Is he a viable vice presidential material? I've said. The terrain is very wide, mm. and the flag bearer would decide on who he thinks is appropriate to help him get the job done. We need to retain power in 2024, and I'm sure he knows what to do. The experience that he's gained 16 years running with uh, then candidate Akufo, being vice president for the last seven years, it strengthens you. And then this very tough electoral contest that we all saw recently. So, um, I, I think we should allow him the latitude, you know, instead of trying to I impose things on him and make it, the, the, you know, the main issue at stake in our politics right now. I don't think, I, I don't want to add on to that fire. Let's explore the chances of the party yeah. going into the next election. Mm -hmm. And this is a party that's just been in power for eight years. Mm -hmm. We have had a cycle since 1992 of not keeping the party beyond eight years about the economy which is also come up as a major issue in the republic of ghana yes the vice president who is the flag bearer was the head of the economic management team of the government that's currently in place yes. does he stand a very bright chance going into the next election 
what are the pros and cons into that election? See, all across the world, governments have suffered because of the economic crunch. Mm -hmm. And Ghana is not an exception. And we all recognize that it's been a difficult seven years. It's more so the last two, three years because of all the externalities that have happened. But I think he's got a fantastic opportunity to chart a new course. And I'm happy he gave a signal there, the last there speech, yeah. Because I believe that it cannot be business as usual. We yeah. cannot continue to do the same things and expect different results. The fact of the matter is, if you look at your economy, you've got to spend what you earn. You should not live beyond your means. Simple and straightforward. As okay. a civil engineer, I'm just, I always like to predict outcomes. Mm -hmm. You want to model the things that are likely to happen. You, know, you understand? So I do believe that it's easier to control your expenditure than to push your revenue. And so for me, I, I, I pushed out my six-point plan. Mm -hmm. I'm very hopeful that the flag bearer who adopt two, three, and maybe all, you know, it will help him, it will help the country. We need to go to the Ghanaian people with a new narrative. You know, it's not so much residing in the past. We can learn lessons from what has happened in the past, but what is important is the kind of vision, the leadership that we want to present the, to the Ghanaian people. And he should, he, I believe he can earn their respect. He's a likable personality, you know. Uh, he's, I've never seen him angry before, you know, so, and he's very humble. People like him. Of course, he's going to carry the difficulties of the stark reality that we are in. But I, I do believe that this provides us an opportunity. Our party, MPP, is a very strong machinery. And I do believe in my heart of heart, and I say this in all humility, that we have the numbers more than the NDC. And so if our base even is... Even after eight years. Yes. Even if our base is energized, first and foremost, and a lot depends on the parliamentary primaries. And my advice to the national executive, to the flag bearer, is to encourage a sanitized electoral environment so that people don't feel that they have been cocooned or been hard done by. And therefore the results that come out, the, the parliamentary yeah. candidates that are elected becomes very acceptable to everybody. I mean, look at the acceptability of all the rest of the aspirants mm -hmm. in, at the Accra Sports Stadium. It's because the process was seen to be manifestly open and transparent. Mm -hmm. That is what we need to work for. That's how come in 2015, we're able to work that way and generate the 169 mm -hmm. seats. You know, no attempts. Allow the party people at the base to choose who they want to represent them. Of course, if you support people, you can do so in a quiet way without being overtly domineering. And that is very important. So we need to have a harmonized atmosphere in the party, get everybody on board. I know after an election like this, they are bruised egos. Mm. So, I, I, and then I was very happy he said at the Accra Sports Stadium that the work begins now. Okay. So there's no time to celebrate. So there's no time to rub salt into people's wounds. Mm -hmm. We've got to let everybody know it's the MPP that is the victor, not any particular person. That there's a bigger battle, not only to win the elections, but to transform the country Ghana. For me, that is paramount. The transformation is a mindset change that we need. Mm. I've talked about the reorientation of our thinking. In fact, it's one of the questions I intend spending half of this interview on. But before we transition from the parliamentary premise you just talked about, yes. it is the view of Dr. Isaac Ousman, who is director of research at the presidency, mm -hmm. that mindful of the performance in the just and the primaries mm -hmm. of some MPs that were out and out in support of the vice president, mm -hmm. and yet their constituencies uh, did not vote, or the delegates in those areas did not vote for the vice president, is it spells doom for their future, or if the elections were held at the same day, Primaries and the presidential primary, though they have lost with, the election. Some, some wanted to happen that we fought against. Yes, yes, yes. You know, at the end of the day, um, I've never believed in polls. Okay. From time immemorial. <laughs> but there's no better poll than an election. Okay. So I think every one of them should process this result mm -hmm. because it's a form of referendum, you know, in the various constituencies. So I think it's the way you process it that matters. It doesn't mean 
that if you could not deliver the, the, the mandate for the vice president and you supported him, it means automatically you're going to lose. It's a completely different election. Okay. It's how you interface it to your base. It's how you go back there and uh, talk about the things that matter to them, you know, is important. So it is the narrative. And I think this idea of patronage in politics, we need to de-emphasize that. It is eating deep into our fabric, and it they is not good. They have to show loyalty by going out there, massing votes for him, and uh, show everything possible, fight whoever is in your way, to make sure that you are seen as truly loyal to the vice president. And no, to no, I don't like that. I think we should not create a cult figure around individuals in our political tradition. The CPP did it with Dr. Nkoma, and you see what has happened to them. Our party has survived the 60 years plus of the tough political terrain in Ghana because it was based on principle, not personalities. So I don't like the hero worshipping that is developing in our political tradition in Ghana. And I think we are a bit too celebratory as a people. Mm -hmm. And we, we tend to mass around people of power okay. and edge them on. We become enablers instead of being the checks and balances. Political leaders need strong people around them who can look them in the eye, Raymond, and tell them and call them out when they are going off course. Mm -hmm. That is what we need in our country right now. Strong leadership, strong checks and balances, strong political parties. And political parties, they're not, not edging on their presidents, no. They are making sure that they're holding their president's feet to the fire for the good of the Ghanaian people. Okay. That's what we should be doing. That is why each president, although it's not in the constitution, has respectfully allowed the party chairman and general secretary to sit in cabinet. It's mm. not in Ghana's constitution. It's yeah. a convention that all of them have respected because they know that they are not independent candidates. They are products of the political party. And these primary officers are supposed to be in touch with the 275 constituencies and can feel the heartbeat of the country and be able to advise them in, in cabinet to take the decisions that would bring benefit to the party and the country. So I think it's important that we don't create cult figures mm. and that we should be checks and balances on political authority. The president is a very powerful person. Yeah. He's in a very powerful position. And that's why he needs strong world public spirited individuals around him, not yes men, not sycophants, you know, and not those who are out to, to be acquisitive. No, we need public spirited individuals in our country who are thinking for the common good, for the collective security of our country, Ghana. It is the view of some, including the director of research at the presidency, that the economy will play a massive role in the next year's election and that if the economy does not improve by June of the incoming year, the chances of the <laughs> government will be very slim, as uh, in Dr. Bamia winning will be very slim. I respectfully disagree with that. You know, in Ghana, uh, and I have been around for a long time, mm. um, people vote for a variety of reasons, mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. And yes, the economy is a factor, but I don't think it's a domineering factor at all. Really? I tell you, in Ghana, there's a lot of sentiments. You know, it's how you relate to people, mm. how you respect the Ghanaian. And that's why I expect our communicators, those who represent the party, the, the, the political appointees, the ministers, to be humble. They should take a leave from the, the leader, the new leader. Mm -hmm. Be humble. Sometimes acknowledge when we are at fault and then win the trust of people. There's no, you shouldn't talk down on people. Mm. Sometimes I've listened to people speak and sometimes they, the power makes you feel mm. like you're floating. They've got to get their feet firmly planted on the ground. There's going to be a tough election. In Ghana, elections are always going to be tough. It's a two-party state. It mm -hmm. came out of the UGCC. Kwame Nkrumah, CPP, and the rest of us, you know, the UP. So, it's, and we have quite similar strength. Look at the parliament. It tells you. I'm always confident the MPP, any day, will do our 45, 46. The NDC will do the 41, 42. Mm -hmm. There's a little spread that we always fight for. Yeah. But 
we are closer to getting the 50 all the time. In spite of all... Even the, after eight years. Yes. Where most elections, most governments after eight years tend to drop by a significant percentage. It, it is true, but I think this, this provides the opportunity of creating a new momentum, a new impetus. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that the flag bearer would offer the party that impetus, that energizing of the party base. Because it is the excitement and the enthusiasm of the base that wins you the elections. And that is why I think the, the polling station executives should focus on their work. Would, you know? he, would he have to clearly separate and let the people know that this is my vision and it's separate from the outgoing government's own? Would he have to dissociate himself from, say, mm -hmm. the happenings within the current government to succeed? Look, let me tell you something. Let's not create the impression that the cu current government hasn't done anything positive. Mm. I, I, I don't subscribe to that. There have been shortcomings. There have been difficulties on different fronts. It's a fact. That's the, uh, the reality that we face. It's a fact. And he, as a vice president, um, will have to carry some of that. At the end of the day, um, John Mahama would know more than most. He has been vice president and president. president yeah. He knows there's a sea of difference mm. in the two offices. So we've got to cut Dr. Baumia some slack. Okay? The buck doesn't stop with him. And in any case, there have been a lot of areas that we can be proud of as a government and areas that think we need improvement. Okay? okay? So I think it is his vision on how to cut the waste to make sure that there's value for money on government contracts and procurement. That's why we are bleeding a lot as a country. And as a civil engineer, I know mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. Yeah. The cost of a kilometer of road in Ghana is about the most expensive on the African continent. It shouldn't be so. Whether we are getting value for money for our projects, whether contractors are being given strong defect liability, liability periods to make sure that there's maintenance, whether we are going to create a maintenance culture in this country. Those are the things that I want to hear and see him do. You understand? So it is not so much the politicking. At the end of the day, once you win the confidence of the Ghanaian people, the hearts and the minds of the Ghanaian people, that you are calm enough, you have the emotional stability and the emotional intelligence to deal with the difficult situation we find ourselves as Ghanaians. And I think he has shown uh, in this very tough electoral environment that uh, yeah. he was able to withstand some of the uh, <laughs> strong jabs that were delivered. <laughs> By yourself in That's right. I, I know that, uh, yes. Uh, I know that. What's the relationship now? It's, I've always had a good relationship with Dr. Baumia. When I was okay. general secretary, I used to pay him visits to him in Kanda. They were yeah. not very excited that you said he came late to the party and that um, he's... I didn't say he came late. I was uh, corrected. Yes. See, it's important that the media speaks the truth and provides yeah. the background mm -hmm. to these things. You know, the statement, the question that was asked was very derogatory to the, the, the image of the party, as mm -hmm. if to virtually blackmail us into electing him. And I said, no, you, can't, you shouldn't say that. And that I think he's been here for 16 years. He's strong enough to go out there and campaign on his own steam. He didn't need all these chief executives massing around him. Mm. I think if you've been the, the running bid for this amount of time, and yeah. vice president, Since you are strong enough, you've built enough. So allow him to, to win on his own steam. That was number one. Number two, I was just saying that for someone who came in at the time, and it is the fact, I was just clarifying things. In Ghana, when you are speaking the truth, we need to state history as it is. He himself said it. And it is a fact that in 2008, when President Candida Kufuado introduced him, he was not a member of the party. But that's 16 years ago. 16 years ago was a whole generation. You understand? So it was, it was not intended to attack him. Yeah. I never did. I like to correct history. He's not the only person I corrected. I corrected <laughs> Kennedy of Japan when he made certain claims about certain monies in 1992. You know, I think it's important that the truth should be our mantle mm. as politicians. No, I get your point, yeah. except that, I mean, I was asking whether or not, because 
people said you later on endorsed him. Look, let me tell before you. Before the election, as before the yes, scare yes, round, yes, yes, yes. You went out there to endorse you. I think it was at a uh, ceremony of a sort. I mean, or he, you were in he, he did me honor. Okay. Uh, by joining me to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the passing of my mom. Oh, okay. And we are Ghanaians. Mm. And we have culture. Of course, at the end of it all, and I'm giving the vote of thanks. Mm -hmm. I prayed for his success. Oh, okay. He understands. I but said, that's tantamount to endorsement. And what is wrong with that? I'm, no, I'm, 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 allowed, that I'm allowed to make a choice. Yeah. Okay, as a human being. So why did you choose him over Kennedy Japan? It is not for you to know. No, but it's important <laughs> that people get to know that. No, no, it's not for you to because know. Because I'm, I'm I think what is important yes. at the end of the day, mm -hmm. everybody votes for a variety of reasons. Of reasons. Everybody votes. Certainly, for a you also be interesting to many of us. Yes, but I like to keep it to myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting point. Now, I want you to be, to be open with me on this question. Which one? The question to do with the candidature of Kennedy and Japan. There are political scientists that have asserted that candidates like in Japan, some even compare him to Donald Trump and all of that, come in when there is crisis, when there is some form of a when people cannot trust a political structure to deliver the goals it's supposed to deliver. He did well. He performed very well in this election. Mm -hmm. For a first time, as somebody that many thought, even as a businessman, even though he's being in parliament, and even as a financier, but many did not expect him to do this well. Has the NPP now decided that the likes of Kennedy Japan are the ones you want to promote as candidates? It's a very interesting question, Raymond. I think we should just deal with the results of the election. He did well. He got, what, 37 plus? Yes. 37 plus percent. And the winner got 61 plus percent. percent. And I think we should focus on the winner. He is the candidate. He is the one who is going to be the face of our campaign. I get it. Let's, 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 let's go move on. That period is over. The, the contest is over. He himself has admitted that he wants to support the The question party. I'm asking is about yeah. the rise of the likes of Kennedy Japan. Look, every electoral environment or mm -hmm. electoral period spawns up different characters. Okay. You understand? As you said, uh, how many people thought that Donald Trump would become president in America? He did. He did. So at the end of the day, it is not for me here to second guess the Ghanaian people or the electorate. I believe and I respect in their judgment. 37% decided to opt for him. But the big majority decided to opt for Dr. Baumia. So I think that is, that is what it is. Let's not make too much of a meal out of an event that is over. Right now, we have a country to look after. Is we have an election to win. Is and NPP, that is what we should be focused on. Is the NPP on. changing? Is I think we should go back to basics. And I said to you right at the beginning of this uh, interview that the values and the principles that animated this political tradition, which appears to have waned significantly, that is what I want to return to, a restoration of those cherished values like. as Ghanaians. Dedication, sacrifice, selflessness, brotherhood, respect. One thing that I want to speak up against in Ghana now, the lack of respect for the aged oh. on the altar of political expediency. So it's politics. So anybody can speak up and spew all sorts of words to anyone. That is totally un -Ghanian. We've got to be very respectful. You know, you can res disagree with respect. Mm. The use of intemperate language, some unprintable words. And now with the proliferation of the, the social media space, People can hide in their rooms and create television stations and mm -hmm. spew out the worst form of garbage, what I call the slash and burn type of politics. We want to pull everybody down, destroy people, spew out lies. And that's why you, the fourth estate of the realm, you have a big responsibility to the Ghanaian people to fact check what people say mm -hmm. and not allow your stations and your platforms to be used to poison the atmosphere to elevate the temperature and also to confuse the younger populations. You understand? We need to inspire Ghanaians. We want 
people to watch political leaders and political programs and be so thrilled that they want to become politicians. Not because of the amount of money you've made. That is unnecessary. Materialism should be banished in this country. We don't need that much money to survive as a human being. You know, so but this you may need that much money to win an election, in all fairness. Look, if the party listens to this advice I'm going to give, which is to allow everybody to participate in elections, if you have paid your dues diligently for the previous two years. Because it's quite clear everybody wants to be part of the decision. Okay. If that is the case, then let them put their money where their mouth is. is have I said it right? You know, yeah. It is important we, we do that. And also build the party at the base. I do not believe in this code, stash, this, that, that, pay money to the headquarters. Mm. Politics is at the base, not in Accra at the headquarters, not even in the regional offices. I am Anna Sabit on the principal streets of the Chiman, and this is Joy News. Independent, fearless, and credible. I believe in strengthening the 275 constituency parties. That is where our strength is. These are the frontline soldiers of our struggle. They are the ones who go to the homes, they canvass and advocate for us. And that's what we should be doing. You understand? So I think that the one man, one vote concept, we should work towards it. I see. And make sure... In your internal primaries, yes. everybody should vote for the candidate. Everybody should be a voter. Once you have good standing for the previous two years, and we don't want that when it's getting to election, then you rush and go and pay your dues. No. They, that's why the party machinery at the constituency level should work. Okay. Everybody should have their card based at the constituency. Why is that important? It's important because it allows everybody to be a participant. It gives you a sense, an organic bond to the political tradition. Now you go to the base, people feel very detached from political authority. But if 400 city and 300 city times 200,000 is such a huge number, mm. imagine opening up to for say 2 the, million. No, no. Let me tell you something. If the party itself has mobilized all these dues, mm -hmm. I would use myself as an example. I have two cards because I spend my time in Accra. Mm -hmm. So my first card was in Ayawaso West. And then I have my uh, card in Aswasi, Asokore Mampo, my constituency. I pay my dues normally sometimes four years in advance. Mm -hmm. I levy myself 10 CDs a month and I multiply it by 48 months and I give them the money. Oh, I see. That's what I do. And then I make them sign in my old uh, uh, ID card. Mm -hmm. I think that we should encourage the party to do so at the local level. Everybody. Once the party does that, even if you have averagely every constituency, having just 2,000 or 3,000 or 5,000 dedicated party members prepared to make a contribution, the party will be resourced at the base. So that when I'm going to speak to the party, I don't need to give them transport. They can organize themselves and invite me. That's how we're going to stop the monetization. That's an interesting point. Yes, that's how we're going to stop the monetization. If the constituencies, everybody has paid their dues, whether it's five cities or I think it should be 10 cities if it's too high for certain rural areas, maybe five cities a month. Once we get the numbers, 5,000, 2,000, 3,000, paying to the treasury at the local level, they will be resourced enough to say, okay, we want to invite this presidential candidate, come and speak with us. They will be able to organize their own transport, organize their own venue. Because when you are traveling around like I'm, I did, I have to pay for the venue. I have to... Where you're going to meet them? Yes. Oh, I see. I went around. You know, okay. you, you pay for the venue. You, you pay a little stipend to support their transport. I mean, if you go to Kufuridia and somebody is having to leave a front plains and come and meet you, let's be fair. I mean, if he's a farmer, he's going to have a loss of productivity for, for the day. He's going to fuel his car. You cannot possibly... But it's not a role he took upon himself. That's what I'm saying. It is a role they took upon themselves. So they should understand mm -hmm. that they did it out of their own volition mm -hmm. and that they, sh they should not feel entitled to any payments. But we as candidates feel that sometimes we want to support them. 
So I, I support them to the extent that I can, whether it's 200, 300, 400, for their transport. That is not bribing people to, pay, to, to vote for you. Okay. In any case, in any case. So if they tell you it, that, if you don't give them that, they will not come? I will tell you that you are not a patriot. You don't deserve to be an executive of the party at the polling station. Because you took it upon yourself to represent the party there. And if you don't understand the role and the responsibility that is demanded of you, in fact, you are so important. You are the one who is supposed to guard our election on election day. So if you are a polling station chairman organizer, who is supposed to be the agent, one of you or two of you, you will be the agent on election day. And you are asking people to pay you before you go and exercise your franchise. You are not worth your standing in the party. Let's be frank with the party and talk to them straight talking. You know, and that's what I believe in. And I said to them, wherever I went, I said, I'll tell you the truth in the face. If I don't get any vote, it doesn't matter. At least you remember me for telling you the truth. Oh, that's what we're telling them. I told them all around. Does it shock you then you didn't win? Not shock me. Because the party I, I, appears to have changed. I, and you I, are still holding on to beliefs that may not be applicable to the people today. I think um, I need, we need to create a critical mass of people like me, like-minded mm -hmm. people. We may be in the distinct minority now, but we still have to fight our corner. I will stand up for what is right. I believe in propriety, and I will die for it. And so that's, that's what animates my continuous involvement in my party and in politics, despite the difficulties I've had to endure. But that's fine. Has the NPP been hijacked? No, I don't think so. When you say it's been hijacked, I mean, there are 200, close to 200,000 who voted. And express their opinion. I, I don't think so. And what I want to, to see more mm. is the party stronger and stronger voices okay. that can be the check and balance on, on the executive. Because yes, we are supposed to support the executive mm -hmm. in government, but we are also supposed to guide them. When would, they are, would, when they, would anybody not be sidelined if they appear to be a very when critical I, voice when I hear against this, their own government? When they, if you are sidelined, will you die? I was sidelined for over seven, seven years. Am I, do I look like a dead it man? It depends on the political objectives of the person. You, your objective is to serve Ghana. If you believe you want to serve Ghana and not yourself, you won't be worried. And you are convinced that every other person within the party's objective is to serve Ghana? I'm not saying that. People have different objectives, yes, okay. but I am hoping that we should work to get the majority to be public-spirited individuals. Mm. That is our duty as leaders of the political tradition. Mm. We cannot be serving ourselves. I'm a, I'm a trained civil engineer, engineering consultant, and I can make do with my work if I'm just thinking about myself and be okay. So the decision to go into politics is to serve and be able to make a lasting, significant dent on the Ghanaian mentality so that we can recalibrate our thinking. We can reposition ourselves. We can reorient ourselves. And we need to have a charter with the, with the public, you know, a social charter with the public mm -hmm. that imposes bigger responsibility on the Ghanaian citizens. We, we, the, the tendency to say everything government, no, we the citizens to have a role to play. I Whether see. we are the teacher, we are a civil servant, or the nurse, or the doctor, or a farmer, everybody has a big role to play to fashion the future that we desire. What do you think is the future of the MPP in Ghana's political landscape? Very bright. Very bright. I mean, our leader is sprightly, young. And there are a lot of young people like myself around. And I believe that in another 10, 15, 20 years, we'll still be around to try and mentor and engineer the new generation to take over. And so we'll be there. I mean, this is a tradition that has survived all the military interventions and all that. Mm -hmm. The NDC is a product of one military intervention. We have been there since independence. Would it be fair to ask you for a candid assessment of John Dramani Mahama versus Dr. Bahamu Bahamia? What I can say is that with John Mahama, he's had an opportunity. I mean, I, be I, I, he's been president already. For one term. Yes. But I'm saying that he's been president. Baumia has not been president before. Mm. So at least we can give him that benefit of the doubt. You understand? 
He has been vice president. John has been vice president. He's been vice president. John has been president. So the things that he's saying that he's going to do, he's had the opportunity to do them, and he didn't do it. So how are we to believe him that he will do it mm. this time round? At least Dr. Baumia hasn't been president before. That's a big difference. And I, I've said earlier, John Mahama should know better than most the difference between the office of advice and that of the president, the president. because he has occupied both. And that's why I'm prepared to cut Dr. Baumia a lot of slack mm -hmm. and give him the benefit of the doubt and support him. Oh, you actively campaign? Of course. I've always done. I mean, I'm a campaign animal. I was, <laughs> yes, I've always, I was, even yeah. when I was, I was on suspension, I, mm -hmm. I, I supported the president's second term. So now I, I would, I'm, I'm obliged as a party person to support the campaign in a very strong way. You know? I mean, finally, reflections on the campaign that just happened. Yeah. For the MPP to be seen to be spared in the development of this country, what should change in future campaigns and future selection processes? I think what should change is the language, a lot of it. And then also, I believe that you, the media, should have pushed for um, a debate. Oh, we, we tried. Are you sure you tried? Yeah, you tried. never did. When I pushed for it, you said <laughs> we were too many. But I've seen debates of 16 oh, yeah, Republican candidates too, yes. in, in America. I pushed for a debate for the 10 of us. And none of you were, was prepared to host it. Should we push for a debate between John Dramani Mahama and uh, Dr. Bamia? Why not? I'm sure it will happen. It always happens. I'm sure but sometimes one backs out. In the last couple of elections, we've not had those. Well, I mean, at the end of Between the day, the top he's, tier now, candidates, not he, the others anyway. he's now, he's now, put, I'm sure when he puts together his campaign team and everything, all those things will be assessed. But I think uh, a political battle is a contest of ideas and a vision. And we should elevate the discussion and discourse mm -hmm. and reduce the heat and intensity and the innuendo mm -hmm. and all the lies and, you know, and some of the irresponsible comments coming from people. It shouldn't be happening. You understand that? I mean, the, the young man who used to work at Dr. Uh, uh, Ali Muhammad's office, who is now an NDC MP uh, in Pram Pram. I mean, Sam George. Yes. I mean, he was in the castle with us, you know. Um, I was surprised at the comment that he made. Which comment are you talking about? Describing Dr. Baumia as a religious prostitute. I think it's completely unhealthy. Those are the kind of wording that we should not be using in our politics. I am a Christian. Do you know the amount of prayers I've received from imams? If you are a politician, do you know the things that you have to do? So does it make me a, a political uh, or, a or a religious prostitute? I'm a staunch Methodist, men's fellowship. Mm -hmm. For Christ, we live. You understand? So... Um, we have to respect all religions. Mm. So, would religion be a problem for Dr. Bamaya going to the next election? I shouldn't think so. I, 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 most people don't see him. They see him as a person. You know, everybody has their religion. And I think he has worked hard enough to win the confidence of Christians and for people. The kinds of reservations people may have, I'm sure that has waned. You know, so we. I don't think people should see him as such. He's a Ghanaian, and that's all we, at the end of the day, we come from different places, mm -hmm. we have different religions, but we are Ghanaians first and foremost. And that's what we should concentrate on. I don't like politics organized around these things. I will ask you which issues will determine the next election, but before then, your true and fair assessment of how Nana Danko Kufa has performed as president. I've always asked, answer this question by telling you that I'm just an individual and I'm also an MPP person. Mm. Although I've always very pride of myself of being analysis. very objective and all mm -hmm. that, we've been through very difficult times. It's, it's a fact. But at the end of the day, the Ghanaian people will make a decision at the polls. It is not for me to second guess how Ghanaians look at him. He's, and 12 months in a political Life is a long time. So then people can turn things around? Of course. Of course. I mean, I've always said, I mean, you can, a week, they say, in politics is a very long time. Mm. How much more? 13 months. You know, so I think that 
there are a few things that he can tweak mm. and change. Should he change know. ministers? That's something I've said many times in the past. I'm not going to repeat myself because now. Because this, this end, is planning for electioneering period. I, I think planning should, for the future of the party. I think you should allow the, the new leader. I'm sure he's his vice president now. I'm sure they'll have discussions as to how things should be done, which would help or enhance his chances of winning. There are some who said President Kufo did things too late to help the Nath Banker Kufuado. There are some who say that. Yes. So we can learn from that experience. So I think then uh, President Nakufuado can learn from that if indeed he buys into that and, and perhaps listen to his vice president a bit more. I don't know. I'm not in there to, to know what, what goes on, but mm -hmm. I, I suffice it to say that I believe that he should have a sit down with him and enhance his chances of victory. Okay. That's what I want to say. Would the reshuffle enhance the process? The reshuffle is a tool of management. Sometimes it's not kicking people out. It creates new synergies, new energies, turning people into different places, and it sends a strong signal. Because when you keep people sitting on one chair for so long, it creates a funny mistrust that they don't want to get up because there's something yeah. there. You understand? So that helps. That, that helps. But like I said, I've said it too many times to repeat it here. Oh, okay. So that's the point you've made consistently. Yes. I thank you so much today. But um, your final words before we end it. No, I want, uh, I want the MPP people to feel a sense of pride um, in what they've been able to achieve, going through all this poli difficult political terrain. And I want every one of us to feel a part of the decision that we all took. Um, everyone has their choice, but once the majority's choice has been delivered so manifestly, I think all of us, it is incumbent on all of us, patriots of our party and country, to work with all our energies to push the party to a third successive victory. It is going to be tough, but I think we have the wherewithal and the human resource to be able to do it. Do so to win the confidence, the trust, the minds and souls of most of the Ghanaian population. Ladies and gentlemen, Kwabna Ejaja Prom, many thanks to you for watching.